It is Wednesday, October 26, 2022, and we are here tonight to study the book of Genesis at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We'll be in Genesis chapter 21 tonight, so you may want to be turning with me to Genesis chapter 21, and we'll be in Genesis 21 in just a few moments. Uh, we're very glad that you joined us tonight. We're glad that you found us on YouTube, and we would also invite you to join us this coming Lord's Day morning at 9.30 for a Bible study. We're getting back to our study of the book of Isaiah, and uh, Caleb should be back in town ready to teach that, and then we'll also join together for our weekly worship assembly at 1030 as well. If you have any questions about what you see or hear in class tonight, give us a call or send a text to 608-224-0274 or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com and we would love to hear from you. Tonight we get back to the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings written by Moses. And of course, over the past couple months, we've been studying the life of Abraham uh, Abraham has been promised a son. God has renewed that promise a number of times now, and the big day has finally arrived. So let's jump into Genesis chapter 21 tonight, and our first paragraph is Genesis 21, verses 1 through 7. Genesis chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. Then the Lord took note of Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was one hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. So basically everything we've been studying over the past two months all comes down to this. God keeps his promises. And it's kind of interesting the way Moses, the author of this passage, puts it in verse 1. He kind of repeats it, doesn't he? The Lord took note of Sarah as he had said. And then the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. So the same thing, kind of restated in a couple different ways, just for the sake of emphasis. With Abraham at the age of 100 and Sarah at the age of 90, I believe at this point, uh, Sarah and Abraham have a son. So exactly as God had promised, just as he had said he would do, and just as God had commanded, they named their son Isaac. Also as God has commanded, Abraham circumcises his son on the eighth day. Well, in verses 6 and 7, we have an update on all of this from Sarah's point of view. So it's not just about Abraham here, not just about God keeping his promises. That's a big part of it. But uh, Sarah is thrilled as well, and everyone is thrilled about this. Sarah recognizes that God has done this, and so this is a blessing from the Lord. This is not something they accomplished on their own. And in verse 7, we have an interesting usage of the word children. And I would just kind of ask us tonight, how many children does Sarah have at this point? And I mean, obviously the answer is one. Isaac is her only son at this moment, and yet she uses the word children, plural, to refer to her one child. And this is not unusual. This is how we talk today. If somebody asked me if I have children and if I only have one, I would say yes. I wouldn't object or argue with that. That's just the way the language works. Uh, but it does provide a little bit of information when it comes to the qualifications of elders. So this is something that we've noted before as we've studied those passages on elders in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1. But in Titus 1 verse 6, when Paul says that elders must have children who believe or believing children, uh, this passage here in Genesis 21 seems to affirm that having one child does qualify as having children. So, in terms of the qualifications of elders, one will do it. That It's not a matter of how many a person can have. And, of course, this isn't the main point of this passage. The main point here is that Sarah is thrilled to be a mom at the age of 90. That's obviously the big deal going on in this first paragraph. Uh, I would also point out that children do have a way of bringing laughter into a home. Uh, not all people appreciate children in this way, but children are truly a gift from God, and uh, children do have a way of making us laugh. I know we've done a lot of laughing in the Exum home through the years, and I think it really kicked up a notch when children arrived on the scene. Um, children, <laughs> children are hilarious, 
and uh, I think children in many ways are good for you and uh, good for the family situation and all that. So uh, children definitely have a way of making us laugh. And uh, kids, uh, I hope you're watching tonight. So uh, we do a lot of laughing in our family. Uh, let's continue tonight with Genesis 21 verses 8 through 14. Genesis 21 verses 8 through 14. The child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. Now Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, mocking. Therefore she said to Abraham, Drive out this maid and her son, for the son of this maid shall not be an heir with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the lad and your maid. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her. For through Isaac your descendants shall be named. And of the son of the maid I will make a nation also, because he is your descendant. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar, putting them on her shoulder, and gave her the boy and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. Well, in verse 8, Isaac is weaned. Um, we don't know exactly how old he is. We're thinking maybe several years have passed. I mean, I've read various things on that for the ancient world and their custom. Maybe three years old, give or take a little bit. And, um, and now we turn our attention to Sarah's servant, Hagar. So starting in verse 9, Sarah sees Hagar's son, Ishmael, mocking. And this perhaps takes place during this big party uh, over the, the weaning. I guess we don't have big parties for that today, but they did back then. This is a huge life event uh, in the life of a child. Uh, in my life and the uh, life stages of our children, I think the biggest event for me was when they could finally buckle themselves into the car seat in the back of the minivan. That was absolutely huge for me. My life changed. I no longer had to climb back into that third row and, and wrestle, but we could just explain, okay, time to buckle up, and they would do that on their own. I'm just saying that, that was a huge thing for me. Uh, but of course, here in this time and place and their culture and all that, the, the weaning was a huge deal and uh, apparently a big party over this. So during this time, apparently in verse 9, Sarah sees uh, Hagar's son Ishmael mocking. And apparently the word translated here as mocking is pretty much the same word we had referring to Sarah laughing at nursing children in her old age back in verse 6. Um, but this kind of laughing here in verse 9, though, <laughs> it's not the good kind of laughing, is it? Is it? It's, uh, it's uh, mocking. It comes across as negative in some way based on the context that we have here. So it might have been intended this way, uh, in a making fun of kind of way, or it might just have been interpreted in this way. There was something to it that uh, was uh, misread on one side or the other, perhaps. Uh, but either way, Sarah is now angry. And uh, Sarah is the star of this party here that they're having. And Sarah wants this woman gone. She wants Hagar out of there. And she wants Hagar out of her home. And um, I do find it interesting how she refers not to Hagar by name, but refers to her as the maid. I, I don't know if you caught that or not, but uh, kind of degrading her. You know, she's not a part of this family. She's the maid. She's the servant uh, in this household. So there seems to be some emphasis on that. And according to verse 10, her main concern is that she doesn't want Ishmael to be an heir along with her son Isaac. One of the commentaries I was reading earlier today suggested that they might have been concerned that Ishmael would grow up to be kind of a role model for Isaac, as the older brother had maybe a 17-year head start, give or take, depending on the timeline. And they're seeing some danger there. At least Sarah is in particular, not wanting the influence of uh, Hagar, the Egyptian, and her son, and maybe kind of leading their son off. And I think there is some validity in that, especially when we consider that Abraham and Sarah are old. When you have a son at the age of 100 and the age of 90, um, you may not be around too much longer to raise this son. And they wanted those influences out of there. So at least that is uh, some of the speculation on the reasoning behind this. Uh, in verse 11, Abraham is greatly distressed over this, obviously because Ishmael is his son as well. Uh, ultimately, though, God tells Abraham, go ahead. Uh, let Sarah take the lead on this one. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her. And the reason is God will take care of it. Abraham's name will continue on through the descendants of Isaac, but God would make Ishmael a great nation as well, since he is your son also. And then once again, we have Abraham rising early in the morning. I think I mentioned a week or two ago, we've seen this before. Yeah, that was back in Genesis 19, 27. 
uh, with Abraham getting up early to look at the aftermath of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we'll see this again once more with the sacrifice of Isaac in Genesis 22. So we have three occasions when the Bible says that Abraham got up early in the morning. And I kind of like that. I'm an early morning person myself. But Abraham gets up very early. And he sends Hagar on her way with Ishmael along with some bread and a skin of water. So not much in terms of supplies, especially considering how wealthy Abraham is at this point. But he sends her away and she heads out on her own with her son into the wilderness of Beersheba. So let's continue with Genesis 21, 15 through 21. Genesis 21, 15 through 21. When the water in the skin was used up... She left the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him about a bowshot away, for she said, Do not let me see the boy die. And she sat opposite him and lifted up her voice and wept. God heard the lad crying. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter with you, Hagar? Do not fear, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him by the hand for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. God was with the lad, and he grew, and he lived in the wilderness and became an archer. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Well, starting in verse 15, Hagar and Ishmael run out of water, and not wanting her son to die, she leaves him under a bush. And again, as I alluded to in the previous paragraph, I think that uh, some of the commentaries were saying he was in his mid to late teenage years, maybe 17 years old, if we've added up the timeline correctly. So in my mind, I'm kind of thinking a little baby, but apparently more time has passed than that. Maybe we could do more research into that if we want to get more exact about it, uh, if that's even possible. Uh, but she heads off just far enough so that she doesn't have to watch him die. This is so... Uh, so painful. This is not the way it should be. He seems to be dying first. And I find it interesting how Moses uses the term bowshot uh, when describing the distance in this passage, if you caught that up in verse 16. And I also find it interesting that one of our members uh, just reminded me of the range of a typical bowshot just this past Sunday morning. Uh, some of you know I was heading out to do some bicycle hammock camping over at Blue Mountain State Park this past Sunday afternoon. And just talking with people in the entryway at church on Sunday, I just kind of wondered out loud whether hunters might be a concern. Do I need to be worried about this? I'm not a hunter. I don't know how these things work. And uh, Gary, one of our deacons, told me, you know, don't worry about bow hunters. Uh, because if I remember correctly, he said the arrow starts to drop uh, about 30, maybe 40 yards out. And in other words, I, I didn't really need to worry about bow hunters on that trip on Sunday afternoon because I'd be close enough to be seen pretty clearly at that distance. And uh, so didn't ne really need to worry about that. Uh, rifles, on the other hand, that would be a concern in several weeks, but uh, I would need to be wearing blaze orange in that case if I were doing that trip in uh, gun deer season. But I only mention that tonight because it's kind of interesting that Moses, the author of this passage, tells us that Hagar sat down about a bow shot away from her young son so that she wouldn't have to watch him die of thirst and starvation. So close enough to see him, uh, but not close enough just to be overwhelmed with the uh, awfulness of what's happening here. And uh, now we know, uh, based on this conversation Sunday morning, um, she was most likely maybe 30, 40 yards away or something. So roughly 100 feet. Uh, very roughly a little bit less than the uh, frontage of our church property on Acewood Boulevard. I think that was like 130-something feet across the front yard there. Um, but the depth of a typical city lot, if you can picture that in your mind, that's how far she was away from her son. In verse 16, she says, Do not let me see the boy die. I would kind of ask, to whom is she speaking here? It just says that. It's a question. Do not let me see the boy die, or it's a request, I should say. Um, who is she talking to? And I think since we aren't told that anybody else is with her, uh, I'm assuming this is probably a prayer of some kind. And so she then she lifts up her voice and she weeps. And at this moment, God hears, not necessarily Hagar, but notice God hears the boy crying. So God hears the cries of people, of children in particular. And in response to hearing the cries of Ishmael, uh, God sends a messenger, an angel, and this angel brings a message of comfort that God has heard the voice of the child and that God will make a great nation of him, which obviously means that this child will not die uh, on this day. 
At this point, the angel opens Hagar's eyes. She sees this well of water nearby. She fills the skin with water. She gives Ishmael a drink of it. And then notice in verses 20 and 21, God blesses the child. He grows up in the wilderness. He becomes an archer. Um, it's the season, so we got archery mentioned again here. This young man becomes an archer. His mom ultimately finds a wife for him from the land of Egypt. If you remember, Hagar is from Egypt, and so she goes back to her people to get him a wife, to find a wife for her son. You know, I would point out normally the uh, father would make those arrangements, as we see elsewhere in a number of passages. Uh, but Abraham is no longer in the picture here. So this is Hagar on her own, and she makes arrangements for her son to find somebody to marry. And this leads us to something, I think, of a practical lesson from this passage, as we note that God pays attention to single mothers. I think that's I think that's a good thing that we can get out of this passage. Obviously, the situation is not ideal. It's just messed up. It's a, the ultimate family dysfunction going on in these chapters here, but God ultimately sees what's going on. And God sees what's happening in this family, and he is with them out there in the wilderness. Uh, can we think of any other single mothers in the Bible? I know if we were together, we could discuss this, but uh, can you think of any other single moms in the Bible? Um, I'm thinking in a way, Naomi may fit in this category. I know her daughters were probably a bit older. Um, maybe the widow of Zarephath, I think she would fit into this category with her husband being out of the picture. Uh, in the New Testament, most likely Mary at some point, Mary the mother of Jesus. Of course, Joseph is there at the beginning. Um, he's there uh, when Jesus is 12 years old, but Joseph disappears at some point between Jesus at the age of 12 and Jesus on the cross. So at some point in there, something happens. Uh, Joseph most likely dies. He was probably a lot older than Mary when they got married. Uh, maybe he leaves. We just don't know. We don't know the answer to that. But uh, Joseph is gone by the time uh, Jesus is dying on the cross. And Jesus obviously has to then turn to John and arrange for his mother to be taken care of because his dad isn't there anymore. His stepfather, or a half-father, we might say. But I think we learn from the, from these situations that God sees and he cares for women in these situations. And uh, certainly, uh, God is aware of all of the painful things that are happening in the world around us. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 21, verses 22 through 26. So the story shifts a little bit, and we move over here to Genesis 21, verses 22 through 26. Now it came about at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, spoke to Abraham, saying, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my offspring or with my posterity, but according to the kindness that I have shown to you, you shall show to me into the land in which you have sojourned. Abraham said, I swear it. But Abraham complained to Abimelech because of the well of water which the servants of Abimelech had seized. And Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, nor did I hear of it until today. So notice, we shift away from Hagar and Ishmael, and we move toward Abraham's relationship with his neighbors. And here we have an issue with Abimelech. If you remember, Abimelech is the king of Gerar, basically the land of the Philistines. And I think the Philistines at this point, it's more of a, an area than an actual uh, name of a people. And uh, this is the second guy, by the way, Abraham kind of deceived into thinking that Sarah was his sister. We studied that last week in chapter 20. So Abimelech and the commander of his army, now they come to Abraham and they want a treaty. They want an agreement of some kind. Basically, uh, it looks like God's being pretty good to you. God is good to you. And and we've been good to you. And, and so we want you to promise to be good to us in the future. Be honest with us and be kind to us. Kind of a two-part a promise that they want to have made here. And this is based on Abimelech's observation, again, that God has been very good to Abraham. In other words, they can see that everything Abraham does seems to prosper. Uh, Abraham is gaining strength. He's, he's getting uh, more flocks, more herds, more land, and so on. And these men need to come to an agreement with this man before things get disagreeable. And I kind of find it interesting that the, the power balance has shifted a little bit here, hasn't it? Remember, Abraham deceived this guy about his wife being a sister and all that because Abraham was scared of getting killed by this guy. Now what has happened? 
It looks to me like Abimelech is scared of getting killed by Abraham. So the, the situation has flipped. Well, in verse 24, Abraham agrees. But then he does have this one issue. Abimelech's men had seized a well that Abraham's men had dug. And Abimelech pleads ignorance on this one. And I think this reminds us that sometimes people have things against us that we know nothing about. <laughs> Isn't that a, I think, a practical reminder from this passage? Sometimes people have things against us that we have no idea about. We have no idea that we have said or done something <laughs> against another person. Maybe totally innocent. I mean, even if it was a, a mean or a sinful thing, that's one thing. But a lot of times something happens and we just don't even don't even think about it. We don't even know about it. And so I might do something that I have no idea is offensive to another person. And in the same way, you may do something that I find offensive and, um, and we may have no idea. Um, you know, so sometimes all that we need to do is to simply bring it up, communicate. And I, I think we need to remember that Jesus addresses this from both directions. Number one, if we realize somebody has something against us, we have to go to them and work it out even before we go to worship. And that's in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 23 and 24. So um, if, if I know based on your body language or something I hear being said that you have a beef with me, I have to go to you. And then secondly, if somebody sins against me, uh, I must go to them in private. And of course, if that doesn't work, we take a couple witnesses with us. If that doesn't work, we take it to the church. That's Matthew 18, 15 through 17. So I, th I hope we notice how that goes in both directions. We're, we are really without excuse. If I know you have something against me, I have to go to you. And if you sin against me, I also have to go to you. So it seems <laughs> between the two of us, hopefully there is some way that we can work that out. And that's what Abimelech does here, or uh, Abraham does. So Abraham... Uh, takes this concern to Abimelech. And this brings us to the last paragraph tonight. So let's conclude tonight with Genesis 21, verses 27 through 34. Genesis 21, 27 through 34. Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two of them made a covenant. Then Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. Abimelech said to Abraham, What do these seven ewe lambs mean, which you have set by themselves? He said, you shall take these seven ewe lambs from my hand so that it may be a witness to me that I dug this well. Therefore, he called that place Beersheba because there the two of them took an oath. So they made a covenant at Beersheba and Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, arose and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree at Beersheba and there he called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned in the land of the Philistines for many days. Starting in verse 27, Abraham brings sheep and oxen as a gift to Abimelech. And this is a, a little bit strange to me. Remember, Abimelech comes to Abraham, but Abraham brings the gift. And I'm kind of thinking it probably should have been the other way around. But Abraham is quite wealthy at this point, And the reason comes in the middle of this passage. We have these seven ewe lambs set aside. Abimelech wants to know what it's about. Abraham brings up this concern. Your men took my well. And these lambs will bear witness to the fact that my men dug that well. So it's interesting to me, in a sense, Abraham is paying for a well that was his to begin with. But since Abraham is wandering, the well itself is actually very close to Abimelech's territory. Beersheba was pretty much the southern limit of Israel's land. But it was land that Abimelech most likely considered to be his. Remember, Abraham is the relative newcomer here. So the, this land is on the border. So when Abimelech comes looking for a treaty, Abraham uses this as an opportunity to make a deal, solidifying, I think very wisely, solidifying the fact that his men dug the well here. Very low price to pay for solving this conflict. And we end the chapter with Abraham planting a tree at Beersheba, uh, calling on the name of the Lord in this place, and then wandering in the land of the Philistines for many days. Um, I would take this statement here as a reminder that Abraham seems to be regaining the respect that he lost uh, from his neighbors. Uh, this is the guy Abraham had deceived, right, Abimelech? But now they seem to be working things out. Uh, also, this, by the way, is the first of only two passages, I believe, where the Lord is described as the everlasting God, as a title or as a, as a proper formal name, everlasting God. It's mentioned here, 
And then also in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. So that's kind of significant. We need to note that in this passage. And then I would also point out that I just love how Abraham plants a tree. You know, I love planting trees. And if you've been in my house, you know that. I've got fruit trees, shade trees, bushes. I mean, trees are awesome. And I especially love the idea of planting a tree as something of a memorial or as a reminder. It's beautiful. It, it grows over time. And it's kind of neat to think about going back there through the years to watch it grow and mature. Okay, you, you make something out of uh, stone or wood. It's just, it weathers and it's like slowly disintegrates over time. You plant a tree and assuming it all goes well, it gets bigger, it gets stronger. It changes during the seasons. It's just an amazing uh, memorial. Uh, when we first built our home on the southwest side of Madison more than 22 years ago, one of the first things we did was to plant an autumn blaze maple. Um, our kids were three years old and uh, one still on the way at that point, but we found a tree that was roughly six feet tall and maybe an inch or two in diameter at the trunk. I mean, just like the size of my thumb, this thing was like a, a twig about as tall as I was. And I think we actually had to uh, put some of it out the back row vent window in our minivan just to get it home. I, I don't know if minivans still have that back window that just like cracks open about two inches. Um, our van had that way back when, and I remember we put the tip of the tree through there so it would fit in the, uh, in the van with the car seats and all that kind of thing. And uh, the yard was nothing but a huge pile of dirt and mud at that time. But our priority was planting a tree. I mean, we knew uh, we want a tree right there, kind of just southwest of the main point of our house to give us some shade in the summer. And we wanted that tree to get as much of a head start as possible. So that was the first thing we did, I think even before we put grass in, if I remember it correctly. And uh, that tree is now maybe 50 feet tall. It is huge. It has been a true blessing from God through the years. Uh, you're looking at just a small part of it in this picture, that uh, beautiful, I don't know, orange, yellow color up at the top there and on the side. And I don't know whether you can see this, but uh, you may be able to catch a glimpse of uh, Superdog down on the uh, lower left-hand side of this picture. I mean, I cracked the door open to take that picture and she came running thinking there was food involved. I uh, got the ears flopping in the breeze. But I just share this as a reminder that Abraham plants a tree on this occasion, and he would have been able to watch this tree grow down through the years. Uh, it was a testimony, and it was a reminder to both Abraham and Abimelech. Well, that brings us to the end of Genesis chapter 21. Next week, we hope to come back and look at chapter 22 and the sacrifice of Isaac. I hate to spoil it for you, but uh, this is where we're heading. So chapter 22 next week, let's read ahead and be prepared for that. But thank you for joining us tonight. I hope to see you this coming Lord's Day at 930. We're getting back to Isaiah. And then after class on Sunday, also be there for worship at 1030 for that assembly. But let's close this class by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are truly the everlasting God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are the God of creation and the King of our lives. And as we've seen tonight yet again, you are a God who keeps promises. And you are a God who hears us when we cry out for your help. We pray that we will learn to trust you more, and we pray that we would also have the faith of Abraham. We come to you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. Amen.